Oh, my name is Laird Klingler. I'm a librarian with the Cornish Historical Society, and we're here at the uh, town office to interview Steve Taylor. Uh, the date is May 12th, uh, 2017, and uh, Billy Scharf will be doing the uh, interviewing. Well, Steve, thank you for coming, and uh, I I'd like to begin by saying it's a great honor to have you here. Well, uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. I regard you as the foremost living historian of the Upper Valley. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're very honored that you're here. Uh, may we start with um, where and when you were born? All right. Well, I was born uh, in, in the Hanover Hospital in 1939. Uh, I need a little context. Uh, uh, Taylors came to this area uh, via the, uh, well, in a way, the, the uh, Cornish colony. My grandmother, Taylor, was a maiden lady, and she and her sister were uh, musicians. Uh, they were brilliant concert pianists, and they were induced in 1895 or so by St. Gaudens and others in the Cornish uh, colony community to come and uh, 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 build a cottage. So they commissioned Platt to build them a cottage on the top of Freeman Hill. And uh, they were uh, urged to come here in order to provide music for the, for the colony people on Sunday afternoons. And so they played duets of classical music, and that's how they got going. Uh, but my grandmother Taylor would eventually meet a professor at Dartmouth College named Robert Longley Taylor. He was a professor of Romance languages. He was a famous character. Uh, uh, they would marry, but he uh, he uh, owned a very large spread in Norwich, a uh, beautiful brick house on Elm Street, uh, now owned by uh, Jane Watson Stetson, uh, and it included 200 acres of very what is now enormously valuable land. He was known as Skunk Taylor. He. Uh, uh, was walking to class in Hanover from Norwich one day through what was then the covered Ledger Bridge and he had an encounter with a skunk. <laughs> and rather than go home and clean up and change his clothes, he went on and taught class. And so he was known as Skunk Taylor on the campus at Dartmouth for many years. And later he would go on to Williams College where he was a dean. Uh, but they, he and his wife, Grace Lawrence Taylor, uh, hung on to that property on Freeman Hill and uh, they kept it as a summer place. And my father went to Williams College, graduated in the bottom of the Depression, 1933, and he and some college chums occupied that house uh, for a couple of winters. And uh, I don't know exactly how they survived, but uh, they, had, uh, they did some farming on the side. But eventually, that became the place where my father, eventually my mother would live their lives and uh, where my brother and sister and I grew up. And um, Did he uh, farm? Uh, yeah, my father was a farmer and he was a school teacher. He taught first at Lebanon High School and he taught at Kimball Union Academy and later he taught at Windsor High School for a number of years. He was an English teacher, uh, but he was a farmer and he was a very accomplished beekeeper. Uh, always had some sheep and some cattle, so my brother and sister and I grew up with that experience. And um, he, uh, uh, he was also uh, uh, quite an authority on the, on the fauna of the Connecticut Valley. Uh, he, was, uh, he had, uh, I don't know, supernatural powers of observation of birds and wildlife, and, and botany, uh, anything you could talk. Uh, he, he was very, very knowledgeable. And so he was a very remarkable individual. So, so you grew up on a farm? Well, yeah, it was, it was the farming experience. Yeah, we had that, always had some. We were in the 4-H and... Uh, tell, tell us about we, you know, your, your brother. My, my brother, son. David, he's three years younger than I am. Uh, David uh, was a um, graduate of Middlebury College and he taught school uh, in a school district in Long Island most of his career, uh, and his wife is also a teacher. They retired and reside in Plainfield. Uh, they have a, a house they built on part of the old farm. Uh, my sister, a very accomplished musician, uh, she has uh, uh, been a teacher of music throughout her life. 
she completed her studies at uh, Smith College and then uh, uh, the Cincinnati Conservatory. Oh. And uh, she uh, and her husband uh, were in private school work. He was the head of school of Hebron Academy, a prep school in Maine. And when they retired, they returned to Plainfield and he uh, uh, and my sister occupy the house where we all grew up, that house on top of Freeman Hill. She lives there, she and her husband live there. That's correct, yes. Yeah. And David is not far away, right? They, David and Helen both are right, right there within a quarter of a mile of each other. Tell us a little bit about, about growing up, you know, in Plainfield. Now, you said you were born in 1939. Correct, right? yep. yeah. Well, I started, my father was farming through World War II. He had a dairy farm and uh, milked cows and shipped milk, as they say. Uh, and um, when I started school, um, although I lived on the Plainfield side of the boundary, I started school in the Tracy School, which was a Cornish school. And at that time, I always have understood that uh, Plainfield and Cornish, they kind of balanced up uh, populations in their schools a little bit by swapping kids back and forth if they, you know, depending on the, the, where they happen to be. Uh, in terms of the geography. So anyway, I started first grade, I went one year to the Tracy School. On Lang Road. Uh, on Lang Road, and yes, uh, there were 23 of us in that one through eight. There were three of us in the first grade, Martha Archibald, Dora Perry, and me. And uh, we had this marvelous teacher named Eva Bernard, a woman who I believe taught in the one-room schools of Plainfield and Cornish for over 50 years. Uh, and she was a marvelous teacher. And uh, everybody said, how in the world could there be education in a room where there were eight different grades and there, there was education? And uh, it was what you'd call today probably quite progressive. Um, the eighth grade girls would help the first graders with their ABCs and the seventh grade girls would help the uh, second graders with their numbers and so on. And the eighth grade boys kept the fire going, kept the room warm. The seventh grade boys would go down the hill to the Floyd Rogers farm and fetch water <laughs> and bring buckets of water up. And we had a big old crock in the corner of the room where drinking water was, was dispensed. And uh, so it was quite a, a wonderful experience. Uh, Eva Bernard. Uh, you know, I, if I can interrupt, you know, I remember from an interview with Stuart Hodgman. Yeah. He mentioned her. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. She left indelible mark on all those who passed through that, yes, I remember that, that saying, school. Saying Absolutely. Saying that, yes. um, I went to school with Fitches. There was Wendell Fitch and Clara. Uh, and then there was uh, uh, the Perrys who lived right up the road from there. Uh, it was a big family. Uh, there was uh, uh, the uh, uh, Snellings. They lived over on, towards 12A and uh, a family named Merrill, I recall. Uh, and so, you know, you remember all those, those names, of course. Sure. Uh, Eva had an interesting thing. She, during recess, would go out on the playground with a notepad and a pencil. And she listened very carefully. And if she heard bad grammar, bad English usage, she would make note of it, write it down. And on Friday at one o'clock, the Good English Club would be called to order. And she might call upon you, if, ask you to stand beside your desk. And she might say, Stevie Taylor, and you'd stand up. And she would say, I heard you say, I ain't got my coat today. What should you have said? And Mrs. Bernard, I should have said, I don't have my coat today. All right, very well, you may sit down. You never forget lessons like that. <laughs> did you ever get called upon? Oh, huh? oh yes, oh absolutely, we all did, you know. Uh, she had a keen yeah. ear. And then after that first year, uh, the, the arrangement changed, and I went to the Plainfield School, which was very much like the Tracy School, except there were two roads. Well, where uh, was the Plainfield School? Right in the village, it's now the uh, Smith Auction Barn, or gallery. And um, they, uh, there were two roads. Uh, the first through fourth were in one room, and the fifth through the eighth were in the other room. And the, the place ourselves now, the auction gallery, is, is that where the general store and post office used to be? 
No. That's a different building. Oh yeah, it's up uh, across from the town hall, diagonally across. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. the Smith's auction gallery. Oh, 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 the Bob Smith. Uh, Bill Smith. Bill Smith. Bill Smith. Yes. Yes. Oh, that, oh, that was the school. That was the school. Yes. Oh, I see. It had I originally see. had two rooms, and then at one point they expanded it. They built a room on either side, made it a little bigger. So I went there for the balance of my uh, primary education. Um, we, uh, you know, if there was a unifying characteristic to that experience, it was continuous turnover of teachers. Uh, we had a lot of different teachers over the years, and uh, uh, I finally had a man for a teacher in my eighth grade, Richard Rogers, who I believe lived most of his life. He's still going, as far as I know, in Cornish. Uh, and he later would teach at, I think, Bellas Falls or someplace, but lived here in Cornish all. Many, many. Did you go on then to Windsor High School? Uh, no, I, uh, at that time, because my father was teaching at Windsor High School, I just thought it best if I went to a different school. And so, at that time, in Plainfield, you could go wherever you got a ride. And so <laughs> there was a neighbor who was an architect in Hanover, so I would ride with him up to Hanover. So I went to Hanover High School, and uh, that was kind of an interesting experience. and. Uh, um, I played sports, and in order to get home, I usually had to hitchhike. And so, I, what, what sports did you play? I played uh, football in the fall, and in the spring, I was on the track team. And um, in those days, uh, hitchhiking it was always easy to get a ride from Hanover to West Lebanon, but then I'd have to walk from uh, the corner in West Lebanon down through to the bridge down by the where the big new supermarket is there in that area. And, uh, I'd be lucky sometimes to be one car would come along in an hour. Uh, but usually they were from Plainfield to Pity on making me a ride. So <laughs> that was part of the experience. But at Hanover High School, I had made a lot of interesting acquaintances that I kept in touch with throughout my life. Some we had some, I had some very interesting classmates. Uh, one uh, was later the mayor of uh, Lexington, Kentucky. And she is the uh, head of the Board of Regents of Higher Education of Kentucky still. Uh, and another woman was a very brilliant student. She was the queen of the senior prom. And, and she went into the sisterhood. And she was a mother superior in an abbey in Connecticut for uh, many years. And uh, she um, eventually would renounce her vows. And she still uh, is a lay uh, executive of some sort with the Roman Catholic Diocese of New York City. Well, we had a number of other interesting people who yeah. have done interesting things with their lives, the bankers and teachers and business people and so on. So, an interesting crew. Well, now, now, although you went to school in, in Hanover, um, my impression from talking to people that in terms of town association that people in your part of town or in the west would have gone to Windsor, yes, people over here great. would go to Claremont. Well, now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. In Plainfield, the northwest corner, many of them would go to a high school in West Lebanon. Oh, and yeah. in the eastern part of the township, they would go to Lebanon High. And then, of course, there were always a few that went to Kimball Union. Uh, in any given year, in my time, there would be three or four. Of course, they were only boys because Kimball Union was all male at that time. But in time. terms of towns that you would have associated with, would Windsor have been your town that you went into for shopping or entertainment? Uh, or? Yeah, and West Lebanon, West I Lebanon. guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Windsor was important. Certainly for my brother and sister, they both went to Windsor High School. And they had all sorts of, uh, you know, the people they went to school with, they formed these friendships that endured through their lives with uh, kids from, uh, Weathersfield and Brownsville and Heartland and, uh, and Windsor. We always like to ask about the past recollections of Windsor, especially as compared to today. Oh, heavens. Oh, my God. Well, tell us Windsor, about Windsor, Windsor, was, Windsor was a, was a, a functioning uh, community. And of course, you had two major industrial uh, uh, installations. You had Goodyear Tire and Rubber which uh, employed hundreds and hundreds of people. It was unionized, the wages were fairly good. And then there was Cone Automatic Machine, 
which was a machine tool company, a precision metalworking uh, outfit that had deep roots in Windsor that went back to the 19th century. And uh, boy, lots of people who lived in Plainfield worked at one or another of those places. Uh, they would they worked round the clock, uh, particularly in World War II. Uh, they, they were big, uh, big employers, reliable employers. And so uh, Windsor would supported a vibrant main street. Uh, it, you know, it had two drug stores, hardware store, a J.J. Newbury's, Five and Dime, a uh, men's clothing store, a little department store called Fowl and Johnson uh, for women's clothing. I uh, had a couple of banks, uh, three or four different places to eat. How about movie theaters? Did you go to the movie theater? had the Windsor Theater. Yes, right. it did. Right. And, um, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Had a couple of diners. Uh, grocery stores. It wasn't chain stores. They were locally run. Um, you know, proprietors were in the town, and um, it was uh, gas stations. And had a Ford dealer. Had a Chevy dealer. Um, you know, it was it was a, it was it a be, going place. It must be sad for you to go today. Isn't oh, it, it is. Yeah. But, but I mean, it's uh, Windsor's not unique. I mean, you go to Claremont or uh, Springfield, you see the, what's happened as, the, uh, as those good, reliable industrial jobs went away uh, and what happened, you know, simply uh, declined. But when you go with us today, you can visualize what it was. Oh, absolutely. I'd go right up the street and I can tell you who was in that. That was Maxim's Men's Clothing Store. <laughs> that was Fowler yeah. Johnson. That was J.J. Newbury. That's where the Windsor County National Bank was. You know, I mean, you can sure, point sure. out all those things. All that now, stuff. after high school, you went out to school? Like, yes, I did. Uh, I attended the University of New Hampshire. Uh, but I have to point out that while I was at Hanover High School, I, I became the correspondent for the Valley News for, for sports uh, for oh, Hanover High School. Oh. So that sort of styled me in the newspaper business. Uh, I went to the University of New Hampshire, I majored in political science, uh, and then I uh, 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 was editor of a student paper, and I, I, I had a great experience doing that. And then I served in the Army, and when I got out of the Army, I caught on with a daily newspaper in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. What, what, what were your dates in the Army? My, I was in 19, well, I was actually counting my reserve duty also. I was in for, for six and a half years, um, but uh, it would be from 1962 to 1969. Yeah, and uh, I served. The latter part was on reserve. I was Because that, that would have been during the Vietnam period. Yes, it was. I just missed going to Vietnam. Yeah. I was working in Portsmouth and my unit there. Uh, when I changed jobs, I came back up here uh, to work at the Valley News to run the news department there. I had the title of managing editor. And so I changed uh, guard units from Portsmouth to the one in Lebanon. And within about five months after I made the change, my old unit in Portsmouth was activated, uh, uh, called up, and uh, they, they did 11, to Vietnam. 11 months in Vietnam. And uh, that battalion, they lost 10 men. Uh, including five, two days before they went to come home, if you oh. can imagine. Yeah. yeah, so I did all that, and uh, that, that was an interesting time. Now, from college, then, when, when did you marry and start your family? Okay, uh, I married a woman that was in my class at UNH. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. Uh, 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 and so we were married in 63. Uh, she uh, was an economics major, and she worked in banking. And um, my first baby came in 1965, and she became a stay-at-home mom primarily. And um, then we had another son in 66 and one in 70. You know, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves chronologically, but I'd like to ask you about your sons. Yeah. Uh, t you know, tell us, you know, I, I, I think everyone knows Rob, <laughs> you know, from well, being sure. a select board. But uh, tell us about your children. And, and well, the oldest one is James. James is a, uh, he, uh, he went to the University of New Hampshire, uh, Lebanon High School, University of New Hampshire. Um, and uh, he uh, 
for the last several years, for over 12 or so years, he has been in the town of Enfield. First he was the director of community development and now he is the, the uh, what they call the director of public works. So he has the responsibility for the highways, the sewers, the cemeteries, the solid waste, uh, uh, public buildings, all that sort of thing. He has about 25 to 30 people that report to him. Enfield has changed a lot. It's become a suburb of Hanover and Lebanon and it's gentrified quite a bit. So uh, there's a lot going on in Enfield. So he's done that. And he married a girl uh, from Lebanon and she works at uh, a research organization in Hanover called CREARI. Uh, I don't know exactly what the, it's an acronym for something or other. But <laughs> she has a good, very good job. Yeah. And then the second son, William, likewise went to the University of New Hampshire. And uh, he and his wife purchased, bought out her parents' business, which is called Garfield Smokehouse. It's a smokehouse business that does ham, bacon, cheese, pepperoni, they make sausage and so on. And they sell at the smokehouse and they also have a large number of wholesale accounts and then he also is involved in the fire department he's sort of the assistant chief of the whole town but has he's when there's a fire call usually it's bill that's the chief on the scene and he's in command and this is here with him yeah. yeah and then he is also he also runs in meriden we have a a, a water system public water system, it, you know, it's to take care of the needs of Kimball Union Academy and about 85 or 90 houses, public water supply. And also there's a wastewater treatment plant, so it, it's a network of sewer pipes and a great big uh, facility that treats sewage so that it doesn't pollute the streams. So he does all that. and. Uh, he, uh, his wife, and he are partners in that business. And then there's Robert, and he's the youngest. He's done a, several different things. He was a marketing guy for Catamount Brewing Company, which was the first uh, my, uh, craft brewery in Vermont. It was in White River Junction in the 1980s, and he did marketing with them. Later, he worked as a uh, uh, sales associate for Red River Computer, which is an outfit that sells computer systems to the government and big corporation. He did that for a number of years. And then he ran the farm. And uh, he uh, more recently uh, uh, became the executive director of the Lebanon Chamber of Commerce. And his wife is vice president of a business in West Lebanon called West Lebanon Feed and Supply. It's a, I um, mean, it's a feed store, but then it's a whole bunch more. It's mm. a, a great big emporium of... I think most people know him because of the select board, right? Well, that's right. He's been a selectman now for, mm. gosh, 12 years or more. Mm. He's done that. Yeah. Now, were you... I don't... Chronologically, did you... How did you get to Meriden to the, your present location? Did well, we, 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 we took... I, I took the job at the Valley News. I needed a place to live. And we shopped around and looked at different houses. A real estate agent showed us several, I always remember. And we settled on one right in Meriden Village, right across from the town hall. It was a, uh, interestingly enough, it was a house. It was built by a cousin on my mother's side, a cousin of my mother, probably a second cousin, a man. And it was the first new house built in the town of Plainfield in the 20th century in 1934. <laughs> Let me show you how static uh, things were. There was nothing much happening and Plainfield had endured a uh, you know, sharp uh, population decline post-Civil War that, that hung on for a long time. And uh, so we purchased that house and we lived in that house for, for 10 years and then we built and where we subsequently lived the rest of our married years and um, the way we developed the farm. But it, was that a different house? Yeah, it's a different house. Yeah, I see. Right. The brick house. Where the farm is now? Where the farm is now, that's where we... Was that a farm we, where you bought it? No, it was just wild land. It was brush and 
trees and yeah. nothing much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, let's move to the, you took the job over the Valley News. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your responsibilities and your time there. Well, I, had, I was in charge of uh, uh, the editorial product. In other words, all the news. Uh, I supervised uh, a team of reporters, photographers, um, people who helped edit, copy, uh, assemble the daily newspaper. Uh, to, for, that would, you know, what would eventually get on the press to, to, to print the newspaper. And um, it was, a, let's call it a very uh, intense, high-stress job, a lot of going on. You're at the middle of an hourglass, I guess you could call it. There are a whole bunch of different constituencies that are pressing on you. You have, you have people that want to get their story told in the newspaper. You have other people that don't want their story told in the newspaper. Uh, you have to think about the readers and what's uh, in good taste for the readers or of legitimate interest to the readers. I mean, you're making judgments every 15 or 20 seconds constantly as you put that newspaper t together. And uh, also, it being a small paper, we had a lot of turnover of personnel. And, uh, so we trained, I trained a whole bunch of young people in the newspaper and craft of reporting and that kind of thing. And if they were any good, usually they would move on to a bigger paper. I had people that ended up at the Boston Globe. I had a guy who became an editor eventually at Field and Stream magazine. Another one was in the sports department at USA Today for a number of years. Um, you know, there were, um, many of them did very, very well. Others left newspaper and went into other pursuits and did Do you remember any, any particularly great stories that you had during that period? Well, I had a lot of, you know, at that time, the Upper Valley was getting, was on the precipice of radical change. Um, we were evolving from a late 19th century, 20th century, early 20th century, uh, kind of economy and everything to all occasioned by the coming of the interstate highways uh, that was changing the face. Of I'd the like to ask you later about yeah. the, about the direction of the of the interstate right. highways. Right, yeah. uh, that, yeah. that 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 okay. would change. Um, <laughs> I guess the stories that stand out in my mind are the ones that <laughs> were funny <laughs> and how it would play out. I, I remember once a. A, 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 a train, a freight train, derailed up in Fairland. And among the cars that went off the track, this was in the middle of the winter, was a, was a boxcar full of Schlitz beer. <laughs> yes, well, word got around the Dartmouth campus of this, uh, this derailed train, and uh, Dartmouth boys grabbed toboggans and sleds and went in in the middle of the night and plundered the, the rail car. <laughs> and there were huge quantities of Schlitz beer around the campus for several <laughs> weeks, I guess. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we reported on it, and uh, it eventually it got into Time magazine. And the powers that be at Dartmouth were very upset. They didn't want that story covered, and they tried, uh, I mean, shades of Donald Trump, they would try to say, oh, that never happened, it never happened. <laughs> we had proof positive. We saw the guys lugging the beer out and we took pictures of them. I mean, incontrovertible proof. <laughs> so that was, that was the kind of thing you would deal with sure, as, sure. As, a, as a newspaper editor. Uh, the biggest story I think happened was a plane crash on Moose Mountain. A plane from Boston to the Lebanon airport crashed up uh, in, it was late October about dusk and uh, something happened with the, the avionics, the, 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 the glide path electronics or something. And instead of clearing Moose Mountain and coming down to the Lebanon airport, it crashed near the summit. And so I believe there were 28 or 29 people that were killed in that crash, uh, including a number of notables from Dartmouth who were on that plane. And that, I mean, that was a huge story and it went on for quite a while. It was a, a lot of finger painting, uh, pointing the, you know, the airport, uh, the, the air 
line and company, uh, they blamed the airport and the airport said the problem was on the plane and you know, there were hearings and it was a story that it, it, it dragged out for months and months. And, uh, so. Now, you, uh, after your newspaper career, you became Secretary of Agriculture. Well, uh, along the way, though, in between, I, I left the Valley News after about eight years, 1972, 73, and I freelanced for 10 oh. years. Oh. And uh, we started the farm enterprise, and uh, we, um, I, I, I wrote uh, for a number of different magazines, and uh, freelance life is pretty tough. Um, the main uh, uh, account that I had was an alternative weekly that was published out of Concord called the New Hampshire Times. And um, there were a number of those around New England, at the, well, all over the country at that time, alternative weeklies. And there was the Maine Times, um, the Boston Phoenix, the Village Voice in New York, you know, those kinds of papers. Uh, and I, I wrote for them for seven or eight years. Those were my best years as a journalist. Um, they, they gave me, generate ideas for stories and um, go out and do them. It was a, a wonderful. You did that about 10 years then? I did almost 10 years, yeah. Uh, but then I became the, the, the commissioner of agriculture. I was definitely an outside the box kind of candidate. I, you know, I had, wasn't a, um, I had spent my entire life as a dirt farmer and I had not worked for any other government agencies in agriculture or, or um, any farm organizations. And there were about eight or nine candidates for the job. And there was an, a board that interviewed everybody. And after interviewing all of us, they, they decided to recommend my appointment and, uh, then it took a while to finally get through the political process with the governor and the executive council and finally got confirmed and took over and I was there for 25 years, a long 25 time. 25 years. 25 years. It's a little different in New Hampshire. Uh, uh, department heads have fixed terms. So uh, the Commissioner of Agriculture has a five-year term, but the governor only has a two-year term. So governors kind of come and go <laughs> and there is a there is a sort of a semi-permanent cadre of department executives that uh, with the New Hampshire state government is so impoverished that they, they kind of hold it together to have these people that have the experience and can stay with it. Tell us about your responsibilities <coughs> as Commissioner of Agriculture. Uh, I have a very do? broad portfolio. Yeah. Um, uh, was the Department of Agriculture was created in 1913 uh, in New Hampshire and most other states to protect farmers, to test feed and fertilizer and seed to make certain that they, the farmers aren't getting ripped off by unscrupulous uh, manufacturers and dealers of supplies. Uh, but following on after that came uh, consumer protection to make sure that the eggs are safe to eat, that the potatoes aren't rotten in the bag and all those kinds of things. And so that, that grew over time. So you had, had the, the mission of regulatory protection. And then you also were expected to help promote agriculture, promote sale. So you do information gathering about prices, availability of commodities in the marketplace, and, and um, uh, advisory to uh, producers, you know, uh, say, you know, a good opportunity for asparagus right now and you know doing those kinds of things and so that's that's the way it, 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 it down through time that's the way it evolved um actually when i started in 1980 end of 82 i would say the focus was probably three quarters on dirt agriculture in other words production agriculture by the end of my time that was down to about 20 percent the rest was consumer protection and uh, environmental protection, that kind of thing. So, you know, you'd be surprised to know that the Commission of Agriculture in New Hampshire regulates pet shops and humane shelters. It regulates people who, who uh, 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 decontaminate uh, apartment buildings. 
and people who spray chemicals on golf courses and lawns and uh, all, all of those kinds of things. I mean, they've, they've just added over the years more and more and more, and uh, so we spend a lot of time doing that. So. Now, after, um, after you retired from that, you began another new career. Yeah, I retired in 07 and uh, came back to the farm and helped the boys on the farm. And uh, uh, along the way there, I was invited to become a presenter for the State Humanities Program. Uh, I have to say, back up one notch, I helped get the Humanities Program going in 1974, 75, got it off the ground and then uh, organized it and then passed it on to so I didn't have a PhD so I didn't really have the the um, you know the, 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 the let's say credibility in the academic community so but I helped it you know just take shape that's what I did but anyway so anyway in the, in about 19 uh, no 2009 or so I became a regular participant in their their um, stable of presenters on uh, various topics that would involve uh, the discussion of, of the humanities uh, relative to history, uh, public issues of, uh, you know, culture, tradition, um, and that sort of thing. And so I, I've done quite a number of Tell us a story. You, I, I, one of your lectures that I went to, when you began to become one, and they asked you your qualifications. Well, <laughs> I remember that story, Phil. Well, I, they, 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 it would come up. I mean, you know, um, I had to fill out this uh, form, and one of the lines on the form I wanted to know what my terminal degree was, and all I have is a bachelor's degree, and obviously, what they were looking for are you a PhD or you a master. And so when I, I got to that line, I remember clearly, I just said, oh, obviously I'm not qualified. Uh, I'll lay the thing aside. And, but uh, I received a call from the humanities people. Uh, a few weeks went by. And uh, he said, where's the paperwork? We gotta have it. And I said, I don't think I'm qualified. What do you mean? And I said, I don't th think I'm qualified because I don't have a terminal degree. And they said, oh, don't worry. We'll call you an independent scholar. So <laughs> ever right. since I've been, I've right. been masquerading as an independent scholar. Well, I've been to many of your presentations. So. Yeah. Well, they're, they're a lot of fun. fun. I mean, it, yeah. you know, I approach it more like a newspaper reporter does. But you still are. I mean, I still you yeah. still write articles for yes, the Valley News. Yes, I do. News. I do Valley yes. News yeah. and others, and uh, still do that, and then um, keep you know keep one oar in as a uh, doing a little journalism. And then uh, I also have, you know, over the past few years served on some not-for-profit boards, you know, I, I was on the board of the Forest Society, uh, the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, um, more recently, of course, the Cornish Fair, and uh, the, uh, the Eastern States Exposition, and also an organization out of Vermont called Yankee Farm Credit, which loans money to farmers. Mm -hmm. So I've served on that. So, you know, like I have to say, I've had a, you know, kind of a, a blend of different. Actors. I'd like to, I'd like to move now to get some of your uh, historical perspectives. Um, I, and I've, I've read your articles. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if I could begin with one, not so serious, but more on the humorous side. Mm -hmm. I learned from you what a creamy was. Oh. Yeah, but, you know, being from New Jersey, I knew soft ice cream. Yeah. But until I read your article, I didn't know what. Explain about a cream. Well, it, it, it's a it's it's a Vermont term, and it, it didn't seem to cross the Connecticut River, and I was puzzled by that. I mean, I go into Vermont, and I know what it is. It's soft serve ice cream, creamy, and they often spelled it C R E E M E E. Okay, uh, and. You know, people in Vermont, I mean, that's the definition of a soft serve concoction, probably with a very strong maple flavor. Uh, and so I, the more I investigate, where did that start? Uh, the best research I could find, it started probably as far back as the time of World War II, <laughs> when those machines were perfected that can make that stuff, you know, on site in a diner or a little uh, roadside stand or something. And I, uh, 
so I studied up on it and I, I wrote a story about it. Uh, <laughs> well, I've never heard the term before. Basically. Well, I know, That's I know. A lot of people, they, they were puzzled. They, they had never yeah. heard of it before, yeah. You know, on a more uh, serious nature, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, agriculture in our area. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have said that um, the one true period of agricultural prosperity mm -hmm. uh, occurred with the sheep farming here. That's right. It was in a period from about 1810 to 1840. And Cornish and Plainfield, you know, had thousands and thousands of sheep. And, um, you know, the legacy of that time, uh, the stone walls all over the place. Those stone walls were put up to keep sheep in. And also a lot of the architecture traces to the prosperity that those sheep brought that you had uh, money in the economy uh, that people could invest in, um, embellishing houses, and putting up nice buildings, putting up nice public buildings. Uh, it's interesting, a lot of the churches that were erected in the late 18th century were just big boxes. But uh, when the 1820s and 30s came along, there was money to add steeples and, and you know, put in, uh, improve the windows and, you know, the architectural treatment and, and did all that kind of thing. And very interesting, the, there was this little cluster of very pretty brick churches. Uh, and Cornish, you have one on Center Road. In Meriden Village, there's one right by the Blinker Light. In Plainfield Village, there are actually two of them. One is the Grange Hall and the other is the church across the street, the Community Baptist Church. And then you go over to Heartland, the, the church in the village uh, on Route 5. Those six churches are very, very similar. And they were all built out of native brick from right around here between 1832 and 1837. I mean, look at how they endure today. They're still lovely, they're strong, beautiful buildings. When people had money to invest in good architecture and good building method, and those endure. We, we don't build buildings like that anymore. Nothing and that came from the sheep money. And that was money from the sheep, absolutely. And then at the end of that era, that period when uh, all of a sudden wool no longer became uh, a, a highly profitable commodity, um, you know, it was a cataclysm for this area. Uh, there was no agricultural activity to replace it that could generate that kind of income. So immediately after the Civil War, you had the beginnings of a mass exodus of population. Uh, Plainfield, from 1860 to 1890, lost 30% of its population and 40% of its tax base. I mean, people just packed up and went away. And, uh, you know, it was a very sad time. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, it brought about a period of melancholy, of, of grieving, that was widespread over rural New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, as land that had been cleared at enormous toil was being left to, to what they call go back to the Indians, being left to revert to forests. And it had a profound psychological impact, and you know, people grieved about that. The farming that remained was subsistence type farming? Yeah, yeah, struggle, dairy, fruit, whatever, anything they could figure out. Um, but there was never anything that could compare. Yeah. Well, in, in the 20th century, even, um, many of the homes had barns and cows, yeah, but even that disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that process. That well, that's uh, uh, just the consolidation of, particularly of, well, many aspects of agriculture, of uh, as science and technology has taken over and ruled an intensive uh, application of capital. Uh, so you have consolidation and just... What about pasteurization and things like that? And the tanks, know, wasn't that? That, that? that was a factor, it helped. The coming of the railroad opened up the urban markets to the south for uh, dairy products. The milk could be shipped down there or butter and cheese. Uh, and so that was the way it became organized. Uh, today we don't do it by rail, we do it by big trucks. They haul the milk down there. So there's that. But what's happened is if you take dairy as an example, you just have the remaining farms 
becoming fewer and fewer, but getting bigger and bigger. And the output per animal, the output per man hour, all of those things just goes up all the time. So, uh, what, the present state of farming, now, your farm would be an example of this yeah. diversification. Yes, that's right. Um, is that key now to? Well, for, for small farms like ours, yes. Uh, to have multiple ventures to, to generate you know, income. Um, our farm is not sustainable just on milk from the cows. Uh, Where so do you sell your milk to? It goes on a big truck and it's, it, uh, it's, it's marketed, I mean, uh, uh, it leaves our place and becomes uh, under the custody of a cooperative called Agromark. Oh, and they yes, take our yes. milk and they pay us for it. Mm -hmm. And then they market it however they can and maybe put it in cheese or ice cream or it may go to a plant that sells jug milk. Well, you make, don't you make cheese? Though? We we make cheese. That's yes, a, yes. A, a, a you know, I'd like to add that, you know, for uh, yeah. the grain sells in these Christmas packages yeah. of food items. Right. And I buy them to send to people in different areas. Yeah. And your tailor products are yeah. always praised. Oh, well, that's good. So, yeah. You know, and that, that's, you know. that, 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 there are people that do that, and, 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 and there's opportunity there. Uh, but like in any kind of agricultural venture, 50% uh, of it is making the product, the other 50% is selling it, you know, developing channels where to, to market it. And the same with maple. We, we, uh, we uh, tap the trees on the Yetzavich Reserve in Cornish, oh, yes, yes. and uh, we produce maple syrup. And our business model is to sell locally as much as we can and, and to retail customers and our local stores and so on. But diversification is key for you then. It has been, that's right. Yep. Yes. You know, I'd like to ask, uh, move now to another topic, mm -hmm. um, something that I, that I found fascinating. And um, I've read uh, so much of the Upper Valley change with the interstates. Mm -hmm. And there were key decisions made in terms of the location of the That's house. true, that's true. And, and yeah. I've read some of what you've read about that, so right. about that. I'd like yeah. you to talk about that. Well, the, 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 going way back to 1944, Congress passed the Defense Highway Act and uh, subsequent legislation under Eisenhower in 1953 basically said, we want to have, the federal government wants a network of superhighways to connect air bases and important defense facilities and major urban areas. And so we'll draw lines on the map approximately where we'd like the highways to go, and then we'll leave it up to the states to figure out the exact route. Uh, will it follow this river, or will it go around this mountain, that kind of thing. The states know best, and that's what they'll be charged with doing. And so that's what happened in New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, the, uh, the, the uh, highway, boom began on construction and there was huge blocks of federal money were poured into constructing highways and uh, in New Hampshire most of the highways it was pretty well pretty obvious the route that they would take you know connecting Boston with Portland Maine that's just a straight shot across the southeastern corner of New Hampshire and then a route up from Boston to get to uh, to eventually to um, you know, the Canadian border. It would go up the Merrimack Valley and through the White Mountains and so on. Uh, and then there was one to send a road that would connect Boston with Montreal and it would branch off from Concord and head up. And so that would become a very interesting story of conflict about exactly what route that would take. Uh, there were uh, uh, a large number of people in Claremont and Rutland, Vermont, who thought that it should go west from Concord, New Hampshire, to the Connecticut River, uh, through Claremont, and then over the Green Mountains to, to Rutland, and then up the Champlain Valley. And then there were others who said, well, it go west from Concord for a ways, and then it should go to New London, and Lebanon and White River Junction and up to Montpelier. And so there was a great tussle over that. And it went on for several years. And eventually the decision came down to basic hard-nosed politics. 
and who had the upper hand in that case. You had, um, you had James Cleveland, he was a congressman from New London. You had Norris Cotton, he was a U.S. Senator from Lebanon. You had Lane Dornell, he was a governor from Lebanon. And you had a fellow named Charlie Kelton in Hoyt River Junction, and he was chairman of the Vermont Highway Board. And then you had Dartmouth College, of course, which is, has a, is a very powerful force in New Hampshire behind the scenes. And so that was the route that the highway would eventually take. And so, you know, uh, here we are now, 50 years later, they see the profound impact that the decision had, certainly on Lebanon and Hanover and White River Junction. They're thriving, they have all kinds of development and activity. And then you have Claremont and Rutland, uh, they're suffering all the pathologies of Rust Belt uh, mm -hmm. cities. In it might have been different for Claremont had the highway. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh, absolutely. 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 So you can see that. And then, you know, uh, the highways were laid out hither and yon, uh, not just the interstates. And some of the routes would have really a great beneficial if impact. Take Walpole, you go down there. And the, the traffic used to go through the downtown, and Walpole was just sort of a beaten up place. There was a lot of ramshackle housing, and you know, we just had heavy truck traffic all no. around the clock. Uh, so when the state came through and said, ah, we'll move that, that Route 12 out of the village and put it out in a, in a cornfield around, it would circle around, and then had the transformative effect. Uh, Walpole's, when they got that heavy traffic out of there, People looked around and said, geez, we have a lot, a lot of nice buildings here. Suddenly people were investing in them, painting them up, fixing them up, and now it's one of the most lovely villages. Ken Burns thought so. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and, and Ken Burns and all kinds of, of things happened. And, and that happened in other places as well. And some places, they, they got bypassed and they sort of ended up like Claremont. There's just nothing much going on, you know. They, uh, nothing to really turn it around. Any major decisions relating to, for example, Windsor and then Springfield with the highway? Windsor is a very, very, very funny story about Windsor. Is they didn't, at the time the plans were being made, they didn't, they said they didn't care whether they got an interchange or not. And so to get to Windsor, you get off at a Scutney or you get off at Hartland and you have to backtrack four and a half miles or so to get to Windsor. Uh, you know. And then you look at Lebanon, they have four interchanges for Lebanon. Uh, <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. Now Springfield, I think the problems in Springfield uh, couldn't have been remedied by a different highway route. It's just those three big uh, high precision metalworking industries that went away in the late 70s. Yes. It's just nothing that there to replace them. But, but there could have been a, an exit closer to downtown Windsor then. Well, yeah, right, exactly. They would come in on the county road there. I mean, that would have been the logical place. Yeah. But they let the opportunity go by. Right. I'd like to ask you about an, an, another change, and you have a perspective on this. Um, overall, um, the, the decline of religious institutions uh -huh. in the Upper Valley. Now, the, the, this so many churches are struggling, have closed. Yeah. Uh, when you grow up, that, I'm sure that wasn't the case. Yeah, I'd say, yeah. Uh, and certainly the majority of people, I think, in Plainfield and Cornish had some church affiliation. Yeah. Uh, and the, the churches, were, you know, they, 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 I don't think they were at the bursting at the seams, but people had an affiliation or, you know, they, 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 they nominal, a connection to, to churches, but uh, as you suggest, it, it, that has that's faded. And I believe New Hampshire and Vermont are ranked in the top five in the country for the least religious. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, no, uh, that's that's the truth. Uh, Did you attend the Plainfield Church? Yes, I went to the Plainfield Church. Uh, yes. It was kind of moral bound when I was a, quite, when I was quite young. But about 1953, some younger people had moved into town and they kind of turned the, that church around. They recruited a, man, a couple named Berthold, 
Fred and Laura Berthel, and he was professor of religion at Dartmouth. And they needed housing, and they had a nice uh, uh, parsonage to offer. And these people came, and they, you know, their services and their sermons were, were bang up, interesting, and lured people in. So there was a period there, probably 10 or 12 years, where the, that church was booming. It was really thriving. And, and, uh, and then uh, yeah, it kept up its momentum. You're a member now of the Meredith Church. Yeah. I now, know, you, I, the Meredith Church, when you look compared to the others, it, very successful church operation, very, very yeah. prominent. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it has uh, a long affiliation with Kimball Union Academy. Yeah. Until about 1979 or so, uh, it, all the students were forced to attend service. <laughs> uh, they, they took attendance. Everybody, all the boys, would have to sit in the in the pews, and of course, uh, uh, they, they eventually dropped that requirement. But uh, yeah, that that church uh, has an interesting story. It was a big, beautiful, white, traditional New England uh, church. Uh, uh, so at the top of the hill. Um, and in 1896, it got struck by lightning on a Saturday afternoon, uh, but lo, it didn't burn down. And so they rejoiced on Sunday at service that the church had been spared a terrible fate. Well, on the following Monday, it got hit by lightning again, and this time it burned flat. And it was one of those uh, churches where the town hall was in the lower level, and then the sanctuary was on the second level. And so the town said, we've got to have a town hall. So they went down the hill and built a town hall of their own. And then there was a wealthy man in the village said, I'll pay for building a church that won't burn down. And so that's how we got that stone church. They cut the stone up on the Chellis homestead, had Italian stone cutters come, and that, that, all that stone was cut it's out. It's a magnificent structure. Yeah, it's quite a structure, the Norman style. And um, it, uh, it, um, you know, Port Cochere, you don't oh, see yeah, that very yeah, often. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so, you, have, you have wonderful ministers there. I mean, I, we've had some, uh, yes. uh, I think the emphasis in the last number of years uh, on music has been a big draw. We have uh, always have a very strong. It's a, just an interesting contrast to what's happened over there. Well, true. I, I think yeah. there are. You know, uh, there's with, between the academy and just the general neighborhood, there are people who enjoy music, they like to sing, uh, play instruments, all of that. So that, that, that sort of feeds on itself, I sure. think. You know? I'd like to move now to um, challenges that in our generally in the Yonkers mm -hmm. Valley mm -hmm. um, in terms of change. Um, one of the most notable changes relates to climbing school enrollment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is probably not as much an issue in Plainfield, but in Cornish, uh, certainly. Uh, Would you care to comment on that? What, what, what do you think is happening? Well, what, what's happening, I think, is, is the, uh, the impact of student loans. Uh, a profound impact on the generations of young people who are leaving college burdened with heavy debt. They cannot put together the cash to make down payments on houses. Uh, the cost of land has risen. Uh, construction costs have gone up. And so to be able to buy, uh, I mean, my God, I was 24 years old when we bought a house. Uh, I don't know many people in their 20s today that can go and buy a house. And so they're postponing formation of families. And so we're just not getting the children for the schools. And uh, uh, it's, it's very troubling. Uh, the Plainfield School, we built it in the 1970s. Uh, the design uh, to accommodate 360 pupils. Well, we've never gotten closer than about 320, and now we're barely over 200. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, and that's true all over. Uh, High school enrollments going down around in this area. Uh, some of those schools up the White River Valley, my God, they, they don't, you know, they have hardly enough to put a basketball team on the on the court. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like consolidation becomes an yeah. issue, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Do you see, now this has come up in other interviews, people have different views on this. Yeah. Um, there has been an attempt in both communities yeah. to maintain open space. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, through things like current use, mm -hmm. five mm -hmm. acres zoning in Cornish. Mm -hmm. Do you see any link between, or conflict at all, between preserving open space and land mm -hmm. and the decline mm -hmm. of you know, student population? Uh, if, if, if there was no uh, catalog of houses for sale, I would be more interested in looking at that more closely. But there always seems to be quite a number of houses for sale in Plainfield, and I think in Cornish, and they're at various price levels. So there's supply, but these young people that we want to come in and have babies, they don't have the cash to get the toehold to get to, to purchase one of those houses. Mm -hmm. It's tough. The people that can afford a house in Cornish and Plainfield, there are couples that have two incomes. Uh, they work at the medical center or technology or something, and they, they, got, they bring in a lot of money. And uh, I'd like you to talk, I heard you yeah. mention this one time, um, with, for example, with current use. Yep. What, what is, talk about the impact of current use on tax, taxation for people, for example, who are not in current use. Well, it, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tax shift, uh, no doubt about that a tax avoidance strategy. I mean, it was sold and it was adopted by people who, who argued, uh, you know, it was advocated for by people who said, this land doesn't cost us anything. Uh, we all benefit from having the open field or the forest that we can walk through or hunt deer in or whatever. Uh, and it doesn't cost much to just say to those owners, you keep it like that. Uh, we'll give you a tax break. Um, uh, that's the, 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 that whole f subject is is due for a good econometric study, and uh, nobody's really doing it. I just don't see. I mean, Evans Plainfield and Cornish is, I believe, over eighty percent of the land area is in current use. I mean, but it's all magnified by the reliance on the property tax to fund the school and plow the roads and all that, uh, functions that in most other states are, are funded more by sales taxes or income taxes, all those kinds of things. So uh, we really... Uh, yeah. But in, in essence then, are, aren't people who are not in current use subsidizing those? Oh, most certainly. Oh, who absolutely. Are. Oh, absolutely. Yes. That, yeah. It is a tax shift. Yes, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Um, it's a difficult issue, isn't it? We, yeah, we yeah, all want yeah, open yeah. space. You know, we all oh, sure. enjoy yeah, that. Right, right. Um, yes. There are people who have studied it far more than I have lately who, who can make a pretty good case. You know, some can make it on one side or make it on the other. Paul Franklin in Plainfield, he's a real authority on it. He, he's very interesting on this. and He, he, he sees both sides of the thing. And, you know, you know, I, I don't mean to advocate a position, but yeah. something you said at the beginning resonated with me um, in terms of like people in Plainfield being able to go to Cornish schools. Yeah. Uh, uh, perhaps in the future there can be more cooperation between, you know, Plainfield and Cornish. Oh, absolutely. Education. I mean, that's what they're saying in Vermont. They're trying to force those towns, you know, South Royalton and Bethel and Rochester to get together and, you know, have one high school so that you can teach. French and Spanish and have, you know, more comprehensive uh, offerings and so on and be more efficient. Uh, but it's tough to give up that old identity. You know, I went to that school, I don't want to see it closed down. And, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's what they're running into over there. Uh, I mean, I, I, you're right, I, Plainfield and Cornish, I guess they already do, they allow or they, they have a joint baseball team or mm -hmm. soccer or something. Yeah, yes. It's great. I think they, we should they, have more of that. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think what you, how you started out was a good yeah. example of that. Yeah. Living in Plainfield, you went to the Cornish School. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that, I could agree Very with that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you see any other particular chat? I mean, from when you were growing up, the area physically, really, well, of course, West Lebanon, the big box stores different yeah but there hasn't been a great physical change has there i mean to, in, 
yeah. from your time. We have uh, more of what I call infill development, you know, where they just use that road frontage. There aren't many big subdivision type developments mm -hmm. here. There's some in Lebanon and Hartford, but you know, not not in Plainfield where they, you know, they went out and carved out a hundred house lots and a big highway or something. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that kind of development. Um, you know, the, the, the changes, I think that, the, the, I guess I'm more interested actually in the social changes that have occurred oh, yes. as from, from the time. And I, I, I pinpoint the tipping point, or the big turning point, would be the coming of television here. Um, you think in 1953, there was no TV here. And nobody watched television, and you had community activities that generated fun and uh, community um, got people together. You know, maybe a Grange meeting or a PTA bazaar or three-act comedy plays that were always being produced and so on. But when television came, everybody kind of shut down on those kinds of things and began sitting indoors and watching television. And that became sort of the focus of conversation. Everybody talked about what they saw on television last night. And so I think that was the beginning of social disruption as we knew it. And um, improved highways and more reliable transportation. Um, instead of going to an activity at the town hall, you probably would hop in the car and go to White River or Lebanon to the movies or Claremont to the movies, or you might go to a restaurant or you travel to visit friends in another town that, uh, you know, before improved highways you, you didn't tend to do much of. And so that, that happened. And then People talk about the decline of volunteerism. Yeah, no, that, that, that came up. People it's began to focus more in on doing things that uh, gave personal gratification rather than community uh, things. Yeah, like, like there, there was some of that yeah. in there. Um, but uh, this is an interesting area here. I mean, from Cornish north to Orphan, this area is, um, we have a, uh, we're very fortunate we have a very balanced economy. Well, we've got so many different pieces, like when we had the big recession in 08, it didn't really devastate us the way it did in some other areas. Um, you know, we've got, we've got uh, retail, we've got all kinds of retail. We've still got some manufacturing, we've got Timken Aerospace, and, a lot of smaller companies that make stuff. We have transportation or a transportation hub. We have that kind of thing. We have still have tourism. We have people who come here, you know, to visit the St. Gordons and they come to visit the Quichi Gorge. And um, then we have uh, financial services and we have a lot of retirement uh, uh, community, they got Kendall and those big developments to the north of us, they attract a, they tend to be a fairly prosperous clientele that uh, want to live here their retirement years. Um, we still have forestry and agriculture, we still got quite, it's fairly extensive, but it's, you know, it's Dr. Uh, Hitchcock, and then the, the health care, is in terms the health care and yes. education. You know, the Dartmouth College itself, yes. and then the healthcare industry is huge. I mean, it's a big Dartmouth Hitchcock, and then they have all these uh, satellite hospitals that they've got under their, you know, sort of in their penumbra, I guess you could call it. You know, Mount Escutney, New London, I guess Claremont, Alice Peck Day, they're all sort of, you know, they're all part of Dartmouth Hitchcock for all intents and purposes. So you've got you know, a lot of a fairly well balanced economy, and so that we're fortunate in that sense. But we, um, do you see any great changes coming? Um, I guess I'm not very good at forecasting. I really don't know. Uh, just see. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I see out there that would 
be radically different. I mean, Dartmouth College is not going away, and the need for healthcare is not going away. Mm -hmm. There'll be some disruption in this retail sector. I think that's that's fairly certain. Yes. That's already happening. I guess. I wonder if in five years you go back to West Lebanon a couple of those big marks. You know, we're going back in time a little bit, but t tell me what it was like to drive <laughs> up on a 12A. Oh, heavens, from uh, uh, where the cement plant is now and the, right. the big paving of material plant. On the other side of the road was the Lebanon dump, and it burned all the time. And you would drive through this great wall of acrid smoke. Uh, on your way out. <laughs> you pitch down that hill uh, where the Walmart is over on the right there, that was a dairy farm. And the cows would be out in the yard and the farmer would be out feeding those cows. It was a Finlander. His name was Corpella. And uh, he was there. And then you went along and there were beautiful meadows on the left. And then there was another dairy farm there named Johnson about where the weather vane seafood place is there. And then you went a little further up to where, uh, where McDonald's is, and that was another dairy farm. That was Milford Illsley. And on the other side of the road were a few nondescript little bungalow-type houses. And um, then as you got closer to the Mascoma River there, um, where that powerhouse Develop mall is or whatever they call it. There was a building there that was a power generating station to generate power with that Mascoma River flowing through there. And then you went into a neighborhood of, you know, just modest houses, and that was it all the way to West London. When you travel, can you still see the dairy farms? Uh, oh yes, you can. Your mind, them. yes. I can see them. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Interesting story about the Milford Illsley farm where the McDonald's is now in that area. Milford was milking his cows, and a man rolled into the dooryard in a Cadillac, and uh, he got out and went in and talked to Milford, and they said, uh, how much do you want for your farm? And Milford said, well, it's not for sale. And the guy said, well, oh, he, was, he persisted. And uh, uh, finally, Milford figured he'd put him off. He said, uh, $25,000. And the guy said, oh, I'll have a check for you. And Milford thought he'd done a heck of a stroke of business because he went up on Poverty Lane, he bought a farm for $15,000 and put $10,000 in the bank. And he was clearing on this deal. Well, it turned out that the guy who bought the farm down on 12A was a man named John Palazzi. And he was a big highway builder. And he knew which way the highway was coming from Concord direction. And he, he, he went in back of the barns there and excavated out ungodly amounts of gravel to help build the highway. And then he tore down the buildings and used that for a parking lot for all his big uh, construction equipment. And when the highway was done, he subdivided it all up into lots and, sold it to McDonald's and banks and I mean, he probably made a million or two million dollars. Many times more than sure 25,000. Sure he did, 25,000. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a great story. Yeah. Not, not great, yeah, good. I have to think yeah. about it. Just well, Steve, uh, I think we're pretty much at the end. I always like to offer people, is there anything else that you would like to add? Well, I, 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 I have to talk about the, 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 the close tie between Plainfield and Cornish. Um, over the years, cross-border, uh, by marriage, by uh, social engagement, um, it's been pretty, uh, pretty, that North Cornish neighborhood, uh, a lot of those people there would go to the Plainfield Church, that was closer for them to go. And, um, I, I think of the Hodgmans, right? The Hodgmans, yes, yeah, we were all there. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, you know, we, we, we knew everybody over that way, uh, you, know, you know, all on the, going up the road, who was lived in what house, and you know, close back and forth. And then I think, true, between Cornish Flat and Meriden, there's been a lot of, a lot of back and forth over the years. Um, 
uh, we were we were young. I remember uh, the Cornish Fair. That was a big thing, and everybody, all the kids in Plainfield, we all went to the Cornish Fair. Well, we still do, <laughs> and uh, you know it, it, it ties it helps tie the towns together. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the towns, you know, you think they would be uh, mirror images of each other, but they're not really. They, 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 they have their own personality. I think uh, Plainfield has is, is, has made choices that uh, make uh, Plainfield is a, a much higher tax town. Our, our tax burden is a lot higher. Uh, the, um, the the choices, you know, we've got full-time police department with four cruisers and five officers, that kind of thing. And we've got house-to-house uh, um, -house rubbish collection, and we've got, you know, things that people have said, we'll pay for those, we th think they have value to us. And Cornish has just gone a different route, figured out a different way that works for them. I mean, I don't disparage what Cornish does in any way, it's just, it's just, just somewhat different. Uh, I think the demographic is a little different in um, tending. Choices are a little bit different. Yeah, but there's not not great differences. I think we both suffered over the last ten years with storms. We've had um, at Plainfield Village went without a store for two or three years. Uh, until this gal that's taken it over and she's really made something of it, Annie, and uh, that was great. And in Meriden, our store went broke and uh, it was closed for 18 months or two years. It was horrible. You know, you know I'd have to go to Lebanon to get a loaf of bread or a jug of milk or, uh, or anything. It was, it was uh, oh God, but the, gal who runs it now, she works very, very hard to, uh, to do a good job, and she does a good job. And I know Cornish Flat, they suffered for a number of years with no store, and uh, you know, people are thrilled to have somebody give it another shot. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's tough. We, we now have a tavern in, in Plainfield. <laughs> it's interesting, uh, in 1996 in Plainfield we did a a community retreat. Uh, everybody could come and they had it at the Singing Hills Center. And uh, on Friday evening I had a spaghetti dinner and we sat around and we talked about all the good things about Plainfield and they wrote them down on sheets of paper and put it up on the walls. And then Saturday morning we came back and all the things that need to be fixed in Plainfield, we could make it a better town, put those up on the wall. And by golly, it was interesting. They, they gave everybody these little stick them, little hot dots, they called them. And you could go around and you put your dots on the things you think are the most important. And if you had 20 dots, you could put all 20 on one thing if you thought that was the most important, you could do whatever you want. Well, it came out, there were about 20 things that were at the top of the list. And number one was we need a pub. You know, <laughs> we didn't want to have to go to West Lebanon or something. Give us a pub. Well, we went 20 years and we finally got a pub. You're referring <laughs> to the pub in, in Meriden? Yes, now? that's new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of the other things uh, were... We, we don't have a pub in Cornish. No, that's right. But a lot of people from Cornish, I see them coming up to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad to have that happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of the other things that were people rated highly were things that just needed a little bit of a nudge, you know, maybe three, four hundred dollars to get it done, like a map of the trails in town that people could have and, you know, know where, where can you park legally and not be on somebody's lawn or something, and, and uh, by golly, uh, there were a bunch of those things, and most of those things we've now accomplished because we, we started a little fun. And, we tried to have that cover Cornish and Plainfield uh, called the Tasker Fund, James Tasker. Yes, yes. And uh, it puts out about $5,000 a year for, you know, small grants to- Are you on the board of that? I'm not, I've raised most of the money for it. I've gotten to the point now, I gotta, before I leave this earth, get the body of it built up more. I, 
it's around 135, 140,000. So you helped raise the money? I raised most of the money. And, Did you? Uh, yeah. And uh, we've got to get it up to 250. Uh, the Chernobyl Foundation, they say that's kind of the the floor where we would like these, what they call advised funds, to have enough, you know, corpus so that they can be more viable. And so I've got to work on that. Find I, I, I don't think many people realize that. I know. It, 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 it's just, yeah. uh, I, I, I did it a lot of it just in a, uh, one round. One person gave me 25,000 of appreciated stock. You know, and that, that got me going, and I've had other people that regularly give a thousand dollars a year. Oh, do you? So, so do you still solicit? The oh, yeah, for the yeah. Well, I've got to do a much bigger push. There's a lot of new people have come in town who, but I need, initially, you know, it was tough because I didn't have anything I could point to that I could say, here's, here's what it can do, here's what it did. But now we've got things, you know, we've helped the meeting house committee yes. in Cornish or. Yes the Cornish Fair buy something or other in Plainfield, it's done a lot of interesting you know, things. As I recall, for, with the renovation of the, uh, for, uh, on School Street for the Historical Society. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, those kinds of there. things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So well, you we'll get more. And then there was a lady who died in Merrin who said, well, she said, I, I put my money in that, but I'd rather have it be more targeted for senior citizens. It's the Malar Fund, and she, that money, uh, they use it primarily to like buy tickets so senior citizens can go to Northern Stage. Is that where the lunches come from? Yeah, lunches and those kinds of things. That comes out of the Malar Fund. Yes, yes. Yeah, those things. Yeah. Interesting. And so, uh, well, but we need, we need more. We can, we can I can more. see where you'd be a great fundraiser. You know? Well, you yeah. <laughs> know. <laughs> you find the time to do it. Sure. The, uh, the, there are some interesting funds. There's one that's associated with the Meriden Church, the Stone Church, that's called the, uh, the Bryant Fund. One of the things it has as its purpose is to keep uh, uh, signboards uh, for you know, names of roads you know, uh, on the corners so people can find their way to you know, Bonner Road or whatever. <laughs> that was a, wow. something somebody in 1898 <laughs> decided that was that we need to do it. Yeah. And we have another one that was created by a man named Herbert Ward. Uh, Herbert Ward grew up in Plainfield and he was a bachelor. He worked for Tiffany's. Could I excuse me for a second? You know, we have a visitor here. Oh, this is good. Yeah, yeah, curious. curious uh, yeah. Can you get, can you get Tucker? Yeah. Mary, Mary <laughs> is our secretary. And this is Tucker, who's always with Mary. Uh, so Tucker wanted to come up and hear your choice. Yeah, you want to go around? Yeah, I'll just, just yeah. close it behind you. Yes. Yes, that's all you have to do. Yeah. It'll be all on. Thank you. Well, that's a first. Uh, this guy, first. this guy, Herbert Ward, Herbert, Herbert E. Ward, grew up in, on the River Road in Plainfield. And uh, uh, he was a bachelor, and he went to work in New York City for Tiffany's. And he worked his entire life there, and he saved every penny he made. And when he died, he left these funds. One is for uh, 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 an essay. The eighth graders, when they graduate, each writes an essay, and then the essays are judged, and the first prize is like $15 or something for him to get. And another fund that he left was to make sure that the piano in the town hall was tuned. Okay? Yes. And another one that he left was to assure that every child in Plainfield had an orange and some candy at Christmas. Oh, my. Yeah. Think of that, huh? I mean, just leave it. Yeah. Yeah. It's still there, still yeah. on the books. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. <coughs> well, really well, fun. I, I've learned a lot, a lot of things you can talk about. Very enjoyable. Uh, you know, at the end of every interview, I always uh, turn to Billy and, and I always say, well, Billy, that's a take.